All right, well, hey, everyone. Well, welcome this morning. My name is Don. I'm the pastor here at Highmark. If we haven't had the chance to meet, I just want to say welcome home. We're so glad you're with us today. And I want to take a minute before I go any further in the service. I just want to look into the camera and welcome everyone that is joining us online today and are with us. And I'd like as a church family for us just to take a moment to celebrate and welcome everyone that's new and everyone that's joining us online. Come on, let's give it up for them this morning. Yes, we're so glad to have you and so glad you're with us. We're continuing week two of a series called It's Not Complicated. And we're talking about relationships. We're talking about dating. We're talking about marriage. We're talking about parenting. And we're looking at biblical principles that really will help us. Uh, they're going to help us uh, navigate all the areas and relationships of our life. And so that's kind of what we've been focusing on. And I, I really think that, you know, a lot of times we believe what kind of that, that's been thrown out there about uh, our lives. And a lot of times our relationships can be, it's like, it's complicated. It can feel complicated. And I want to kind of in this series, look at things and look at uh, the biblical foundation and viewpoint that we can live with to understand that, listen, with Jesus at work in our life, with God at work in our life, it can really uncomplicate some things. And so no matter where you're at, there's something that God is wanting to just help you navigate through relationships. And today we're going to dig in to talk about a little bit more about marriage. Jamie and I have been married for over 22 years. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Okay. No? Okay, that was like a half-hearted amazing, okay. So maybe when we get to 25, you'll, you'll be a little stronger on that. But we've been married for 22 years, and man, it's been a wild ride. And uh, I was just thinking this week, I, I was preparing for this, and I forgot to bring this up with me, so Jamie's going to hand it to me right now. But uh, I, I want to just share this little story about how fun marriage is, or how fun it can be, and how uncomplicated it can be. I... I uh, this might look like an ordinary tube of toothpaste to you, but let me tell you, for me, this is a trophy right here. You see, what happened, let me give you a little backstory on this little tube of toothpaste and give you a little insight into marriage. You see, sometimes it's the little things in marriage that really make it fun. And uh, a while back, uh, I, I have always kind of been someone that said, you know what, I am, I am like, maybe it's a little the Midwest in me, but I'm like, I'm going to use every little bit of toothpaste out of the tube that I can. And in our entire 22 years of marriage, I rarely am the one that will throw away the tube of toothpaste and I will open up a new one. Every so often I go to brush my teeth and magically there's a, there's a new tube of toothpaste in there. Thanks to my wife. Well, I realized uh, a while back that uh, as I was using the toothpaste, it was getting desperately low. It was getting lower than I've ever really seen it. And I was actually having to work to get it out of the toothpaste. And a few days later, Jamie and I happened to be in the bathroom at the same time. And I was pulled out the toothpaste and I made a comment to that effect. It's like, huh, interesting. The toothpaste is getting really, really low. And it was that moment that I realized that not only had I purposed in my heart that I was going to squeeze every last drop of toothpaste out of this, but Jamie was also, at this point, going to now purpose in her heart to not be the one that switched out the toothpaste. And it became instantly a competition in our household. And so for the next several days, we would, uh, we would be squeezing it out. I mean, I, I got serious about it. I'm grabbing heavy things and ironing the toothpaste out of it. I'm like using it and I'm like handing it over to her and I'd just be like, good luck, you know, like, and, and at that moment, the competitive, my competitive streak just comes out. And, uh, and finally, several days later, like Jamie actually, like I open up the drawer. We're not in the, the, the uh, bathroom at the same time, but I open up the drawer and I see a brand new tube of toothpaste. And I was like, victory is mine. Like that's marriage. That's marriage. And what did I do? I didn't discard that tube of toothpaste, but I did go find it in the trash and pull it out because you know what? I threw it under my sink and I was like, this is a trophy of my dedication and the fun that you can have in marriage. And you know, marriage can be 
uh, fun. And maybe I'm just a weird guy that uh, holds a piece of trash for like over a year. Uh, but marriage is, is meant to be fun. It's meant to be something that's fruitful in our life, something that God has designed, that uh, it's a gift from him. And I realize in this room, there's people that are in all different stages and places when it comes to marriage. They're, they're, uh, maybe you are single and you are like wanting to be married, you're looking to be married, and I, I'm telling you, we're going to talk about marriage today, and if you're single, there are things that we're going to talk about today. Take note, because they're going to help you find that right spouse and start your marriage on the right foot. If you're dating or engaged, like take heart, like real strong notes today, because you are about to step into something that could be a little bit turbulent the first couple of years, and you need to figure out how God, the grace of God, help us, helps us through. But my challenge today as I talk about marriage, for those that are married in this place, is I want you to listen for yourself alone, okay? Do not listen for your spouse today. Resist the urge to think, I hope they heard that. Resist the urge to give the little bit of a nudge in that moment. Resist the urge to say, yeah, if they just did this or if they just did that, resist that. And really today say, hey, how can I grow and what does God want to do in my own heart? And and how can I bring my best to this marriage and today, God will like help us just kind of get on the right path. And let me tell you, today what we're going to talk about, I believe if you get this, you apply it to your marriage, no matter if your marriage is in a good spot or it's in a tough spot, if you apply this to your marriage, it will transform and change it. It's the power of God at work in your life. It will uncomplicate the, the complicated things. So that's the perspective I want you guys to have today. And we're going to look at Christian marriage, and our world has a lot of opinions and definitions of what marriage is and what it looks like, and there's a lot of different definitions out there, but we are going to look at not the civil union of marriage, but we're going to look at it as a spiritual union, and that's what the scripture says that it is. It's not just a civil union, but it is a, it is a spiritual union. God miraculously brings people together. So no matter where you're at, there's something that you can grow from this and, and uh, uh, God can, can speak to you. And God, our creator, is the designer of marriage. I think a lot of times we, we attribute marriage to just like our society or we attribute it to like our, our government. But actually, God is the creator. He's the designer of marriage. In Genesis, we read about how he saw it wasn't good for man to be alone, and, and uh, amen. Like, I have experienced, like, I know it's not good. It's a blessing to be married, and, and it can be one of the greatest joys in your life. But our view of marriage has to move beyond maybe just the temporal or what we see in our culture, and we have to look at it. Uh, from the perspective of the spiritual and a biblical view of what Christian marriage is. And when I kind of was thinking about this this week and preparing for the message, I really kind of thought about this, and I think our world, there's probably three different, and I'm going to just classify this into three different views of marriage that are out there. Number one, there are people that go into marriage, and it's a matter of convenience, it's a matter of convenience, and really the, the strength of their marriage is that they're getting something out of it, or they, they need to fill a spot in their life, um, and they are really kind of like depending on that other person to be that, and their relationship is all about what I need and what I can get out of it and uh, what is beneficial to me, and when it's not convenient, then like, it, it, and it gets hard then, okay, I'm going to move on. And the reality is that sometimes people do throw away their marriage too early. They give up on it, and, and they could work through it, but they just, it wasn't convenient. It got hard. But the reality is that God is a restorative God. He's a redeeming God. And last week we talked about how it's a matter of our heart, that when we get our heart in the right place, that that God can work out so many other relational details if we center our heart and we get it focused on him. And so uh, sometimes people have this view of convenience. The second is that sometimes people look at it as a contract. 
You know, you have the, the official paperwork you fill out when you get married. You can almost think of, a, a, of it as like my vows are, are, are simply just a contract. Like I'm saying I will do this and you will do that. But think about this. A contract is actually meant to protect and to limit your responsibility. Like if you're buying a house or you're selling or doing something and you have to fill out a contract, well, the contract is actually laying out the responsibility of both parties and it's limiting your liability and it's kind of um, uh, framing out your rights that you have in that. And I think a lot of times, maybe naturally, we kind of fall to this level very easily, even as Christians, we can almost kind of get to the place of where like, hey, this was a contract. And the contract, you got to withhold, you got to uphold your end. And if you're not going to uphold your end, then, then I'm out. Or I got I to gotta change, you know, like I got to change directions here. But a contract, when it's meant to protect our rights and, our, and outline our responsibilities, like I think there's a different way to look at it. There's a higher way for us to look at marriage. And that is a covenant. And in a covenant, you're, you're actually not saying, well, what are my rights? You're not saying, well, what is my, like, what can I do? Um, and you're instead saying, I'm going to lay down my rights. And let me kind of frame this out a little bit for you. What does it mean to lay down your rights? Well, let me give you like a, a couple quick notes or things. And if you want to follow along today with the message, it is in the Highmark app. And all my scriptures are there. And you can add your own notes. And I would encourage you to do so because... You know, as we look at this, and I, I think there's things that we can all apply to our life, and I want to just frame this out, what it means really to lay down our, our rights. And I think when we get married, we lay down the right, uh, our right of priority. We aren't self-focused, we're not self-centered, but instead we are focused on the other person. We are not going to be selfish, we're going to focus first on God and we're going to then focus on our partner. We're going to then focus on our spouse. And we're laying down our right to priority. We're saying, I want to put the other person first. The other thing we might lay down or the right we might lay down is a right of possession. And, and instead of it's this is mine or I work hard for this, we look at, listen, we are co-owners and we are building this life together. And so I'm, I'm laying down my right of uh, of possession, and I'm saying, listen, Jamie and I, we co-own, and we steward, and we administrate all that God has given us from our income, from our, our household, from our kids, the parenting responsibilities. Like, we look at it, we are a team, and we're laying down our right of possession, like, and, and this is mine, and I, you know, and, and we kind of uh, focus on the other person. The second or the third one is this: is that we also lay down our right of privacy. That we should be open with one another. We should not have secrets. And every struggle that we go through, every struggle that we face, you got to open up. And I think a lot of times, men, you know, they they will compartmentalize things and not open up. It's easy for them to detach a little bit from the emotional side. And, and they won't really kind of share their feelings. But women, even in the same times, won't always share their thoughts. They internalize their thoughts. And I know at times when Jamie and I even have had conflict, it's like, I see that in myself. I don't want to open up, like, and, and I don't, or maybe I'm not even aware of it, but she is. And then she, like, she has to kind of share her thoughts. She sometimes will clam up or hold her back. And, I'm, and, and doesn't share her thoughts. And I think that's the difference between men and women. So we give up our right to privacy. So things that are, we're hiding in the dark need to come out. They need to be in the light. They need to be exposed. And when we get to that level and we lay down those rights, that's the place where we really get to covenant. And serving God and following Jesus is a covenant. The Old Testament, it's a covenant. When we're a Christian, we've made a covenant to God. God, I am going to follow you. I'm going to live by your plans. I'm going to live by your will, not my own. So before God, when we, when we get to the covenant level and we view marriage as a covenant, we're going to say, like, before God, I'm going to serve other people and I'm going to lay down my rights and then I want to pick up responsibility. And I want to talk today about that, about what responsibilities 
do we need to pick up when it comes to marriage? What responsibilities does it, do we need to pick up when it comes to our relationship with one another with, in our marriage relationship? And so we're laying down some things, but we're also picking up some responsibilities. And I want to go to Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to look at a little bit longer section of Scripture. So bear with me. I'm going to read the whole thing, and then we're going to break this down. Because the Apostle Paul in uh, Ephesians chapter 5 gives us one of the greatest I guess, frameworks for a healthy and strong and lasting marriage. And we're going to use this as a template today to really understand the responsibilities that God wants us to pick up in our life. So here's what he says. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. So a little helpful tip for guys. Do not quote that in an opportune moment, okay? Like there is a wrong time to quote that and you're going to do it out of context, and that's not right, okay? I, trust me from experience, okay? <laughs> for wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of his church. He's the savior of his body, the church. Continues, he says, as the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. Okay, so I know some of you are like, oh, okay, I don't really like this. Like, I, want, I'm a, I should be empowered. But here, it shifts to the husband now. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church and he gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. And no one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it. Uh, Just as Christ cares for the church. And we are members of his body. And as the scripture says, a man leaves his father and mother, and he is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. So right there we get the picture of, of that God brings them together. They're united as one. And he continues and says, this is a great mystery, but it's an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. And then he says it again. So I say to each man, you must love his wife as he loves himself and the wife must respect her husband. So right there we get the picture and what God, uh, what God is speaking right here is just really found in this summary, this last verse in verse 33. It summarizes the whole thing. That it's two pieces that need to happen when it comes to uh, responsibilities we have to pick up. And I want to talk about those this morning. And I think after 21, or 22 years of marriage, after 20 plus years in ministry and pastoring, I've kind of like counseled couples um, and I've worked, helped people work through a variety of marriage issues. And I think I've figured out finally how any marriage issue could be solved, okay? Any, like, I've never met a couple where this wouldn't work. Any marriage issue could be solved if simply one thing would happen, and that would be if both people died, okay? (laughs) Now, we laugh, but I'm not talking about the physical death, but what if spiritually they're you, the spiritual death is what I'm talking about. And that they're no longer two individual people, but they are one. And there's a union that happens spiritually. And spiritually, there, we're, we have to be willing to de- die to our own desires and our own will. And that's what it means for all of us to, to make a decision to follow Jesus and invite him into our life and say, God, I want to live for you and I want to follow your plan. We are dying to ourselves and we are picking up not our own will, but the will of God. And that's the first and best decision every person can make in their life is making a decision to follow Jesus. And if you haven't made a decision to follow Jesus every week at the end of our service, you'll have the chance to pray a prayer and you can make that decision. That's the most important decision you can make. But second most important decision 
is who we decide to unionize and who we uh, be spiritually bind ourselves to is that's what happens in marriage. That's the second most, the, the second most important decision we make. And what he's talking about here, Paul's talking about here in Ephesians, is that we're laying down our will and picking up the will and, and, of God and the will of the other person. And we really are submitting ourselves to them. And I think about it like this. Have you ever been in those, one of those awkward moments where it, it probably doesn't happen too much on the East Coast, but here in the Midwest, it happens a lot where you're, tr- tr- you're trying to like yield to someone, like you're about to go through a doorway and they're about to come the other way, but both of you can't pass at the same time. And you both kind of stop on your sides of the doorway and you're like, no, you go, no, you go. And you kind of are saying it at the same time. And you create this really awkward Midwest moment where you're both like in a standoff of who's nicer, like in life. And I feel like if we kind of get this with marriage, it's almost like that. We're almost should be in a standoff of like, no, you go, no, you go, no, you go. You know, and finally someone's got to go. Like, but like, you know, you kind of are, you kind of are kind of saying, hey, I'm yielding to that person. I'm submitting to that person. So let's talk about the three responsibilities that we see here in this scripture that we are meant to pick up in marriage. And the first one is this, is love. We are called to love. And now let me define this a little bit further for you and, and because we might be confused on what that means to love someone. We might think, oh, it's the feeling of love, but I think it's much bigger than that. It, there's much more responsibility in it. And so I kind of define these a little bit broader this morning. If we're going to love people, it's, I'm going to assume the responsibility to love you according to the standard of Christ's love and never justify anything that falls short of that standard. So I speak it like that or I outline it like that because, you know, it's like not our own standard of love. It's the standard of love that God has shown to us. And then I'm not going to justify that anything that falls short from that. That means we're owning it and we're responsible only for ourselves and how we, we live and treat that other person. So we are, you know, uh, we are assuming the responsibility of, of loving at the standard of Christ's love. And anything short of that, we're, we're holding ourselves. We're not going to justify it. We're holding ourselves account, accountable. You see, God's love is unconditional. Even in our marriage vows that often get kind of recited and we hear off the time, it's like there's always something in there for like the good and the bad, the for better, for worse, you know, and it, it kind of says that. And I don't know if we truly fully understand that in that moment. I, I think we have the feeling of love, but I think it's only by the grace of God and, and the love of God in our life that really it helps us love the other person in the way that God loved us. Because his love is unconditional. You see, no matter what you have done, no matter your past, your background, no matter how much things have you kind of feel like you've messed them up, like God's love for you does not go like a roller coaster. It's steady and constant. He's running after you. He's chasing after you. He loves you. And that's even how Romans reminds us in, in chapter 5, Romans 5, 8 says, But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. So we hadn't done anything. We can't earn the love of God, but God's love is unconditional. It's constant in our life. And so when we're loving uh, the other person, uh, it, it is us letting the love of God flow through us. That standard of love. Now, a, co- a covenant is unconditional. It's irrevocable. And I think sometimes where we get to the place with marriage is we've allowed it, maybe as I kind of talked about the viewpoints of marriage, we bring it down to a contract and we almost like, well, if they don't do their part, if they don't fully do their part, then I don't have to do my part. And let me tell you, that will lead your marriage into a spiral. That will lead you into a place where your marriage will be in trouble eventually if you just have the mindset of they have to do their part and then I will do my part. That's contractual thinking. But covenant thinking says I'm going to love you and serve you the way that God has loved me. 
and the way that he unconditionally has, has given the gift of his son Jesus to forgive my sin, then I, in the same way, I want to try to love you with that standard of love. So God, he's calling us right here to love one another in Ephesians 5. And it says, husbands, you're, you're to love your wives. You're meant to, you, we're, you, you're meant to honor, and wives, you're meant to honor your husband. So if your marriage is bad, let me just challenge you with this. Like, don't pour salt on the wound by thinking and acting in a contractual type of way. But instead say, you know what, I am going to serve and love them regardless of what they do. You know what you're doing? You're not putting salt on the wound. You're putting the medicine on the wound. That's what Ephesians is telling us. Is like when we put love into our marriage and into our relationship, you're putting medicine, not salt, on the wound. And what is the medicine? Well, the medicine is a loving husband can heal a dishonoring wife. And a dishonoring, or an honoring wife, excuse me, an honoring wife can heal an unloving husband. That's the medicine and the recipe that we get here. And so we got to love one another. And let me tell you, you got to plant the seeds in the life of that person. I, I think about the, the first couple of years that Jamie and I were married and, and, uh, we laugh about it now because, you know, like people ask like about our first couple years and I'm like, it was great. It was amazing. And Jamie's like, well, it was a little turbulent. Like there was a couple spots there. And I want you to think about this. You, we are planting seeds with our words. So wives, when you're dishonoring to your husbands, you are, you are planting a seed. And maybe what you uh, when you start off in marriage, what you experience in the, the, the first part, you're actually reaping the harvest of maybe some seeds that were planted by someone else. But you have to start planting your seeds in your marriage and planting it so that you can reap the good harvest that God has for your marriage. And so start planting the seeds. Husbands, start loving your wives over and above, regardless of how she is treating you, regardless of the things that are coming out of her mouth, love her, show her this unconditional love. She needs it and is looking for it. And in the same way, wives, honor your husbands. Stop speaking bad about them. Stop, you know, speaking in a way of complaining to family members or friends or your girlfriends, but instead speak life into them, plant some good seeds and you'll see a harvest out of that. You'll see God change their heart. So, second responsibility we got to pick up. I got to keep moving here. Is we got to honor. We have to honor. So, this means that I assume the responsibility to honor you and to do everything possible to help you reach your full potential in Jesus and live in the perfect will of God. I am going to honor the person that God has, we are spiritually joined with, and I want, I want to help them reach the fullest potential that God has, that God has for them. You got to honor one another. You see, God designed all of us, and he designed life for us to reach the fullest potential, and it's, it's a blessing when we have a spouse that can help us get to there. And now, God might, might have given you a spouse, but maybe he, he hasn't, or you, you've been, maybe you're like, am I called to celibacy? I don't know. Like, maybe I'm called to just live this life. Well, let me tell you, there's a way to figure out, you know, uh, you know, go outside and stare at the tree and then, and then look at a woman. And if they both, you have the same feeling about both things, then maybe you're called to celibacy. Okay. That's my, yeah, what? That's my, that's my gauge. It's like, do you have any feelings there, you know? So like, but, but God, God has given us the gift of a partner, a spouse, a wife, a husband, in order for us to accomplish or reach our full potential. And we have to honor one another that we're saying, hey, I'm not just helping you, like, we're not just you know, serving ourselves, but I am honoring you. I want to see you live into the full potential. I want to see God work in your life. I'm not just seeing what I can get out of it. I think about this, like Jamie doesn't naturally love to get up here and speak or teach or preach on a Sunday. 
um, or even like stand before a lot of people. But I, you know what? I, I want to empower her. I see a gift upon her. I ask her way more than she actually does it. But I, she doesn't like it, but she has the character. She has a calling. And, and she, she like connects with people. And, and I love that. And so my, my, I guess the way I see it is like I want to honor her. And so I, I want to elevate her. I want to do anything I can to help her have the confidence to step into the, the calling and the, what God has for her. And she does the same thing for me. Like, and, and we've done that over our marriage and learned that and, and, and probably had bumps along the way. But like we're here to encourage each other to live into this full potential that God has for us. So men, if we loved our wives and our women the, the way that God loves us, we would empower them. And, they, and that I, I, I get the, I, I love the, the, where our society has gone to empower women more and help them more. And I, I think that is, the outcome is good. I think the spirit of it is a little bit, you know, misguided. But I think it's because men have failed in loving women and empowering them into the full calling that God has for their life. So men, I'm calling you to step up and honor your wives and empower them. And in women, if you honored men the way God designed, you would help them step into the calling and the man of God that they're supposed to be. So our job is to love and to honor. First Peter I know what you're, I, I think about it like this. I think sometimes you're like, well, that sounds all good, but you don't know my guy or you don't know my wife, you know, and we start to be like, well, if I had that person or if I knew that, if I was dating Paul, you know, that would be a lot easier. Or, you know, Abraham, he was a great man, you know, of, of faith, touted in the Bible. He was a great man of God. God had a calling on his life. And, and you could be like, if, if, if he was worthy of being honored, I would, but I want you to see this in in, in Peter, um, 1 Peter chapter 3, let me fast forward again, uh, chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, there's actually Sarah who honors her husband, Abraham. You're like, well, I could honor Abraham. Well, think about this. Abraham was a man that was fearful for his life and that he was willing, when he went to a new town, that he lied about Sarah being his wife and told her, just tell everyone your sister, and the king took Sarah in to be his wife and was about to sleep with her and consummate the marriage and God stopped him. And so here, Abraham was a guy that in that moment, huge fail. He lied, but Sarah nevertheless honored him. It says for this in 1 Peter 3, it says, for this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. And as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Like she put him on a, she put him on a place where she, she called him Lord. Like she, he was the the head of the house. She was a leader. She could have called him liar right there, but she called him Lord. So we got to love. We got to pick up the responsibility to love. We got to pick up the responsibility to honor. And the last one I want to land on today is we got to submit. We need submission. And this just means I assume the responsibility to serve you by submitting my life to the lordship of Jesus and let the, Lord, uh, the word of God set the standard in my life. So we let the standard of God, uh, the word of God set the standard. I love what Ephesians 5, 21 says. The, if we back, we read 22 verses 30 to 33. If we back up just one verse, it broadens it. It says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So we're submitting to one another, meaning I'm going to lay myself down. I'm going to allow not my own standard to be what I live by, but I want to let the standard of God be what I live by. I want to allow God to work on my heart. And how do you resolve conflict in a marriage? Well, you're going to do it by submitting to one another and aligning yourself with the Word of God. And you're going to look to the Word of God. How should we navigate this? How do we do this? What do I need to do? How does my heart need to change? And what's going to happen is as you come together to, and you come under the, the word of God, what it, what it does is it, instead of you start having two wills fighting against each other, you start to see that come under the authority of Jesus and the will of the Lord is overlaying both of your lives.
It's directing both of your hearts. It's growing you. It's challenging you on some of the patterns and things that you've carried into your marriage and the thinking you've had. I'll never remember, I'll never forget, but it's never remembered. I'll never forget. <laughs> I use a lot of words here on Sundays, but I'll never forget years ago when our kids were much younger. I was traveling for ministry and I was gone like an entire week, uh, just about, and I traveled a lot. And so uh, I remember that one trip I just had like a terrible like trip, like the flights were at crazy times early in the morning and I was coming home and I had to get up at five in the morning. I had to fly back to our, our, our city. I had to finish work. I had work to do that needed to be done for the day. So I went to work and then I went and I taught at a university. I was an adjunct professor at a university. I taught there uh, once a week and I had a three hour class. So I flew home I had like the longest day ever, and I got home probably about 7.30 at night, and let me tell you, I was grouchy. I was grumpy. And I remember that I kind of came in like, and I, I was just in a place where I, leave me alone. And so I didn't come into my house with like, dad's home, like, I just was like, I am exhausted, leave me alone. And I could tell that in that moment, Jamie's waiting for me to get home, the kids are waiting for me to get home, that Man, I did not come in with the right spirit and the right heart. I hadn't submitted myself. And so I just remember kind of being like, I'm ready to go to bed. I'm just so tired. I've had such a long day. And, you know, I wasn't probably speaking the nicest. And I remember the Holy Spirit, like, convicting me in that moment. Because I had spent my whole day and given my best to everyone else. But not to my family and not to my wife. And the Holy Spirit, again, submitting myself to God working in my heart, he corrected me. You know who didn't have to correct me because of that? Jamie. She could have. She would have spoke up. But you know what? God gave, gave her the grace in that moment. God allowed her to step back and allow him to work on my heart. So I, I had purposed in that, that moment, I, I purposed that like anytime I come home, I'm going to try to like, I'm ramping it up. If I need an energy drink, I'm drinking an energy drink. Like whatever I need to do, because I'm going to greet my kids. I'm going to greet my wife. I'm going to be so happy to see them. And why did that happen? Not because Jamie nagged me or corrected me or yelled at me, but simply because I was submitted to God. I submitted to the Holy Spirit. And I allowed him to speak to me, help me to see how I should treat my wife, how I should treat my family. I want to pray for us today because I think if we just learn all of us to submit our lives to the Lord, it changes everything. Would you bow your heads with me?